Okay, we can get started. Everybody's here. Our strappers are. Okay. Uh, so we're going to close our uh, today workshop with uh, it's kind of like summing up um, what we're doing so far and talking about the direction that uh, the grants is going. So we started yesterday with. Uh, uh, an overview of what we're doing with this project, and uh, there's a little bit of a plot twist in what's happening, so we're excited to share our next uh, uh, plans here. Um, so, um, this is obviously, it's a, I'm giving you a presentation, but it's really more of a conversation, um, and you know, I'm standing up here, but it's really our collective work that we're talking about, so keep that in mind. Um, some of the things we're, we've been looking at between, um, we had another workshop in, in, uh, in May, and in this one, some of the things we've been looking at to sustain and improve our programs, um, differentiating, um, talking about proficiency and project-based learning, um, strategies for assessment, technology, and the community of practice, which I see you guys are really uh, taking seriously, because every second you have, you're, you're chatting with each other, you're talking, you're establishing a vision, which is good. Um, these are all things that we um, were trying to explore to improve our programs. Um, so in, in, in talks with uh, our um, uh, PI, co-PIs, other stakeholders, um, and other people in the grant, uh, we were discussing which of these we could, can we, can we um, maybe further even more um, in, the, in, the, uh, in in way, what are some ways that we can uh, address some of these to improve uh, our programs even more. Uh, and our eyes fell on technology. Um, we identified that area as an area in which we could perhaps uh, do even more to, to improve our programs. And so, um, we started uh, asking questions about that. Um, what, what, uh, what innovation in terms of technology, to, or especially structural innovation, uh, can we implement to encourage more enrollment at a higher level? So, uh, uh, more enrollment, a, a healthier. Oops. Don't do that. Um, what can we do to, to encourage healthier programs, especially at the at the upper levels? Um, this is something that is already happening a couple of I think many of you are familiar with. Uh, is this supposed to like automatically work? No. I think it's like Google Slides and this old computer. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right. Um, see, it's skipping. Yeah. It's breaking my. Yeah, that happened. I honestly, I honestly think it's the old. Is it computer? computer? So no. Oh, <laughs> maker or no. um, it know it was happening anyway, but then it's just there. It's under. Well, all my punchlines and things are on the same room. So sad. But anyway, it was. What? You could have animated. Oh yeah. 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 That's right, yeah, you know all about it. Brilliant. <laughs> Brilliant. The best. All right. Uh, so. <laughs> all right. So, how many of you are familiar with CoreShare? Okay. Almost everybody in the room is familiar with CoreShare. Basically, it's a uh, network of, uh, of universities that uh, came up with a system in which uh, students at different locations are able to video conference in uh, courses. And so sometimes it looks like this, where you've got a bunch of students in a room and a bunch of students in another room. Most of the time it looks like this, when you have one student from the University of Chicago, one student from Indiana University, one student from uh, Michigan State, and they all, uh, the, the one student from each university is able to collectively create a uh, a section. Uh, so I don't remember what this course was, but it was it is a little uh, course. Um, technology is, in this case, able to uh, bring people together and create courses where really there weren't any, you know, to, both in terms of faculty and in terms of students. So that's a really great uh, thing that is happening right there. Um, CoreShare was built 
uh, using this philosophy, uh, if you build it, then it will come. Uh, you guys are probably familiar with the, with the Lion movie. Um, it wasn't a uh, it wasn't the need that they brought it, but it was the idea, the idea of making this happen. Okay, let's let's make it happen. See, let's see what happens. You know? And uh, they went through a couple of different uh, iterations of. Uh, they started with general uh, general events courses, but then they they found electrons to be the sweet spot uh, where this was working. Um, so people came, and course share is is, is uh, been going on for years now. Um, so then. Here we come, and we're working on collaboration, we're working on material development, and so um, we started asking the question, what happens if we put the course share infrastructure, or at least the idea, uh, together with what we are doing, which is creating communities of practice and um, uh, material development collaborations across institutions. So uh, in our, we put that together, and we thought, well, okay, we can start creating uh, materials that can be developed through core share. And so it doesn't necessarily have to have this synchronous component anymore. Uh, we can move on to, we can, we can maybe try to develop online asynchronous courses uh, with this uh, collaborative model and draw students from all other universities. And so this is uh, what we are going to attempt to do next. Uh, fully online, mostly asynchronous, uh, 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 little uh, courses or modules, um, and so the potential that we have. Or that we, these are these are all conjectures, right? So far, um, we think that this will increase flexibility uh, because students are not tied to a specific course time anymore. Um, they do not have to go to a room that has um, um, uh, video conferencing capabilities. They, uh, and so this, this might encourage more students that are busy schedule to, uh, to continue taking these courses. Obviously, as we, as we talk about, we're, we're, we're gonna hit that uh, second, third year um, uh, spot where, where the enrollment's decline. So uh, I don't remember where I heard it. The last couple of days, I heard someone talking about the fact that having online courses, I think it was you, yeah, having online courses at that spot may encourage students to continue uh, because it wouldn't be seen as such a imposition on their schedule. So we think that's gonna work. I was with more students for the same reason, you know. Uh, this would definitely be more students. Um, effective use of resources, yes, we have these, if, if we create these online materials, they can be used over and over and over and over, and so we're not uh, teaching, creating all the uh every time. And uh, this is something we uh, discussed very, this is very, um, optimistic and uh, but I think it has a lot of potential. Uh, these courses will potentially not only be taken by students at different universities but, but taught by faculty members at different universities, uh, possibly even co-taught at the same, the same semester um, because uh, of, way of you know, different, because of how uh, course load works. Uh, we, could, we could probably talk about I don't even know how to explain this, but we, we talked about ways in which this could happen. So I'll, whenever, whenever that we get there, someone, we let someone who, who knows about administration talk about that. I, I don't know this thing. Um, so uh, obviously, we are going to use the same philosophy. We're going to build it. Uh, we're going to try to build it, and then we're going to see if uh, people come. Uh, our hope, our um, expectation, even is that uh, a model like this will be. Uh, very interesting to students, very, um, because we know students want to continue, but they not always, uh, it's not always possible in terms of, uh, of, uh, of course load to them. And so, that's what we're gonna do. And presentation. <laughs> <laughs> uh, right? No, no, obviously this is not, this is not, this is just, that's the beginning, right? Because this, is what it feels like to teach online for the first time, most of the time, yeah. you know? I don't know, any of you have ever told by your department, okay, you're gonna put the course online. Oh yeah. Right? That's yeah. what happens. That's, yeah. what, that's, that's what it feels like. You're like, wait, what am I doing? It's like week one and you have no idea what you're doing and now students are emailing you. And so the, the biggest issue, the biggest um, or, um, hurdle to overcome uh, when teaching online is 
how do we get uh, faculty members who have been doing the same thing for a long time to embrace and understand online pedagogy. Um, and so that's really, uh, as, as part of this shift, that's something that we really have to become uh, expert in really quick. And so we uh, have developed a um, uh, kind of like a learning path for uh, our, our Hindi working group and for whoever is going to be uh, our year three and hopefully even later on if we get renewed this grant. But we're gonna, I'm gonna show you what the plan is uh, to get uh, faculty members ready to teach online in a way that doesn't feel like that. Okay? And, I, and, I, and I, I, I put this in and I stood there for like five minutes just watching. Really <laughs> 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 you can, you can stop watching. Right? Um, What's that? It looks kind of cruel. Yes, it is. <laughs> Any questions so far? <laughs> Um, so, uh, the first step uh, to uh, train or, or get faculty members ready to teach online is uh, uh, in, in, our, in, in, in our proposed um, learning path is to use a, a language teaching readiness test that was developed, or online language teaching readiness test that was developed at the University of Chicago. Uh, for those of you who are at the symposium in uh, what was it, September? September. Uh, uh, Nick and Ahmed presented this, uh, this new um, test that they developed based on a framework by Lily Compton. Um, uh, the paper is a paper talking about uh, what do uh, language teachers need to know in order to be ready to teach online. Uh, and so out of that paper, they built a, a test. So this test is actually a, a fully online test that uh, anyone can take. Well, not quite yet. It's not ready to go, but uh, eventually you will be able to take and you will get personalized feedback on uh, your perceived readiness to teach online. And it's, it's a really unique test because it's not just uh, a knowledge test, but it's an, uh, an ability proficiency test, really uh, uh, asking questions or having you walk through scenarios and having you uh, respond, how would you do this kind of task? Um, and by that, gauging your, which level you're at. Um, and so the, um, the framework is broken down in three um, areas, uh, technology, pedagogy, and evaluation, so knowledge of how to evaluate certain, um, certain uh, approaches. And so and it's broken down in novice, proficient, and expert teacher. So based on uh, your responses, <coughs> that places you in one of these, one of these areas for, both the, for all three of the ethical constructs. Um, yeah, so uh, this is kind of a common sense, or it makes a lot of sense. When you, when you, when you know about things, you're, you're a novice. When you're able to apply, you choose, you're proficient. And when you're able to mix and, and creatively integrate things, you become an expert. Uh, and so a lot, there's no, nobody is born and ready to teach online in the same way that nobody is born to, ready to teach, right? Uh, the same way that you went to um, school, uh, uh, you took uh, teaching methods and all those things, um, and your first class felt very hard and overwhelming, and there was never enough time to do all the lesson planning. That's the same feeling that you get when you transition to teaching online, even though you're an expert teacher, right? So, um, teachers, our, our, our working groups will be placed somewhere in here, and the point is not to evaluate them, really, but to, for them to, have, to know where to start. That's the starting point. You're, you're assessing yourself. It's going to be a chance to reflect on, uh, on, the, on where they're at and where they, that's where they thought they were, or they were surprised about that. Um, so once this is done, once we have the results of this test, um, our Instructors will take a whole course that I am in the process of developing right now. Um, and the course, uh, obviously titled, aptly titled, Introduction to Online Language Teaching. And uh, I'm attempting to break down uh, the aspects of online language teaching that are more practical. Um, so there's some, there's a little bit of theory that we're going to read and discuss, but it's mostly practical things. Uh, so the competencies of a of language teachers, what, is, what does it mean to be an uh, effective online uh, language teacher? And so these are some of the, um, 
some of the uh, uh, concrete and discrete uh, uh, elements that we are going to look at. Um, presence is a, is a big one. Uh, communicating with students uh, is another big one. Um, the product itself, so the actual course, what does it look like to have a quality course? Uh, what do specifically language, uh, language learning tasks look like online? And then we have, we're going to have a bunch of uh, sample courses to look at from uh, some instructors here at MSU that are doing really good work online. Um, and obviously we're talking about assessment, which is a big one for any online or any uh, pedagogy, but especially for language. And lastly, talking about um, the process itself, some of us are either naturally or by experience more um, practiced with just the, uh, working through processes and, and uh, establishing deadlines. But some others, some of us are not as uh, used to doing that. And so talking about uh, backward design and the Eddy model uh, will be very, um, very pertinent, I think. And um, this is, at this time, we'll actually also start developing the course itself. And so the byproduct of this um, online course uh, for the instructors as students it will become the materials and the courses that we use that will be uh, uh, the, the goal of the grant. Um, yeah, so once this is done, hopefully then we can get to that, uh, uh, that point where we develop the course together. We have uh, at least two, if not more, um, online language teacher mentors that have agreed to be part of, the, of our um, of our group on top of us, and so that's going to be very good to hear from people that have already done this successfully and learned the hard way. Um, and then we'll pilot the course, which we still have to figure out uh, exactly how it's going to work, but it's uh, okay for another day. Uh, and so um, I want to break you guys up in groups. If you want to go back to your community practice, they are, they are uh, now working on. I've got some questions. Uh, this is really me taking the polls of, I'm, I'm taking you as a micro sample of the digital community. And so I want to hear what you guys think about um, online language teaching. Uh, are you, where are you at on the scale from scared to death to super excited to adopt uh, and, and anything in between? Um, so I've got four questions for you up here. Um, maybe I'll give you 10, 15 minutes to talk through them as a group. Yes. I have a previous question. It's yes. like in this online asynchronous course, I, I mean, I'm, I teach course share. Mm -hmm. I'm at the yes. Chicago, so, and here, I, the role of the instructor, I think it's very clear where it is. Mm -hmm. And with online teaching, <coughs> I'm not, with, with asynchronous courses, I'm not sure what the teacher role, one thing is when you design the course, another thing is when you teach the course. Right. Mm -hmm. Other than giving feedback, and I'm saying that because there's a concern in my department, in, in my university, of what will happen with asynchronous courses and our role as instructors. Yes. If you design a course that students can take by themselves, and suddenly our role is giving feedback. Mm -hmm. I, I'm going very fast, yeah, I, yeah, yeah, and, yeah. and I'm not assuming yeah. that. But in your course, so if our role suddenly it's there's an online course that's working by itself, and suddenly, uh, now, now we know that you have 20 students or how, and with one instructor, the concern is what happens if we have all these online asynchronous courses and suddenly we are less needed, yes. let's say, mm -hmm. and what happens with our, so in theory it's a good thing because we get you know, more courses yes. and more students, mm -hmm. but there's this concern, I think, not, not I'm talking yeah. not just mm -hmm. from me, but, yes. so what's, how, how do we fit? There here? is a potential uh, that you could create a course that all you need is really an administrator or a graduate student that takes on 10 sections and all they have to do is email back or just, yes, that's potential, but. Especially because the administration would be super happy to hear that. Yes, uh, so <laughs> it, that's, <laughs> yeah, we may be a little bit less, that's but. where you start, <laughs> you have to educate the administrator in the fact that those courses are also the ones that are pedagogically forced. You know, they're not going to, the students need the, the instructor uh, content, okay. right? And that can happen really well online, probably even better than, I got some stories about that if you want to hear them later. Yes, I will um, Yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Emily and I heard them seven times, and so <laughs> she'll okay. listen to it eight times. Um, 
Yeah, uh, pedagogically and, and, uh, and even like interpersonally, uh, you can create the course to need and require the same, if not more, uh, of the workload that you have, right? Th that's the other thing. Like very often, <laughs> online yeah. teaching yeah, is much yeah, more yeah. than and, and, that's and then you, <laughs> you attempt to do that, and then you, you, you end up giving yourself with more work. But that, that comes with experience. Uh, you hitting, hitting that sweet spot comes with experience. The problem you're talking about, though, is, is just a matter of education and administrator. What does it mean? What kind of course can replace you? It's not a very good course. Um, it gets students to the end, but it's a lot of multiple choice upgraded um, courses that don't necessarily um, equal what you are doing in the classroom or what you would do if you could do uh, Zoom sessions every week or if you if you could really interact with your students writing in a, in a time, meaningful manner, you know. Uh, so, yeah, um, you, 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 you push back, you, you know, you, you show examples of what can happen online with a uh, proper workload and what uh, a good administrator is going to be able to see the difference. And when there. you talk about Zoom, Zoom is a synchronous tool. So yes. So yeah, when I, say, mm -hmm. when I say online asynchronous, I mean there is no required time on the calendar for all the students. Um, so we're not going to say Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, 8 to 9, Zoom meeting. But a lot of times you still uh, have some of that. You say, okay, I'm going to be on my Zoom office hours, mm -hmm. these hours. And then I'm going to require that uh, you attend either this one meeting or this one meeting or this one meeting every week. So students have a choice, and you can work these out with a schedule. Um, I would, I always encourage some of that. I think it's good. Um, it's really good to have. And and when you when you meet in smaller groups, then you have a much better, um, a much more. It's not a class anymore. It becomes more of like a working together on tasks, kind of like the flipped classroom, but then you're, 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 you're doing that um, through video conferencing. So it doesn't become a teacher fronted classroom. Um, so it's, you, you, obviously, you know, video conferencing gives you a lot of opportunities. Um, but yeah, I was always encouraged some synchronous time. Yes. Um, one of the things that they had talked about a lot in, in developing this is the fact that you sometimes get more one-on-one -on -one interaction and get to know the students more. Because in classes, face-to-face -face classes, you often have them just talking to your, their partner or whatever, you know, mm -hmm. and you don't really get to see their responses to things. So in an online environment, you're gonna have them submitting videos like via some kind of tool or, so you're gonna hear all of your their answers. And the goal might be to have students re like respond to other people's videos and those kinds of things. So they're still interacting with each other, but it's not you know a synchronous activity. Um, and Luca has given the example multiple times. We uh, here at MSC we have an English language center, and they run multiple courses online. It was the first time this summer, so we only run it once. Oh, yeah. Well, yeah. It went really well um, from everything that we heard. So the students who were mostly in China. Um, over they were you know finishing up their requirements before they're admitted um, here like with, to regular classes without a, additional English classes um, and they meet via certain Zoom sessions like you were talking about the different uh, meetings and when they all came back to campus one of the students came up to the instructor and they had to take their final exam and just hugged him because she was so excited to see him because they had gotten so close online and then she was like oh my god oh my god i'm hugging my teacher right like but just because that is the kind of connection that they could foster in this online environment by responding to each other by really engaging but in a different way in a well-designed way right not by having a ta grade 50 multiple choice things uh, but what, I, what i can add is is that uh, basically you have your your responsibilities communicating with students and this is very demanding. You have to be in an online course, you have to be communicating with them all the time and they are going to communicate with you in <laughs> different times or different days. Mm -hmm. So this is one difference that you have when you are teaching a face-to-face -face class, you have all the students to 
together in the same time in the same space. So you, if you are going to answer one question, you are going to answer for everyone at the same time. For online, it's very demanding. So you have to be or to develop this confidence that to communicate with students very important. Also, uh, you have a lot of work grading. And besides that, we were talking yesterday about flipped classroom. When you start even responsibility to the student about their learning process. Mm -hmm. So it's not about the instructor being in front of a class and students just, you know, being a sponge of the, everything. So you are going to teach them that they are responsible for their learning process. This is something that I think is very important. So I don't think that we, they will not need us anymore because it's not because you design uh, the online course that you are done with that. You have to be constantly doing new activities or, you know, uh, researching and see what you can do to increase or improve your course. Mm -hmm. So you have a lot of work. Yeah, it's not only yeah. that they, yeah. okay, you, we, we don't need you anymore. Yes, they need us. Yeah, and uh, for most faculty members teaching online for the first time, it feels like a lot more work than the regular class. Part, I, I, I say that most of that is actually experience in second, third, fourth time you teach, it, it's just kind of like teaching regularly, it becomes easier, right? Uh, but there is a, a, an element of um, time consuming tasks that don't necessarily happen in, in a regular class, especially if you start up your class to have a lot of interaction, well guess what, interaction usually means Grading, if not at least feedback, right? Yes. Uh, so that that is a lot of uh, time, and the quality of that interaction and that feedback will depend on your experience and how competent you are. So it's not re easy to replace with a TA. Exactly. Or else. Exactly. Yeah. That's the point mm -hmm. yeah. that I insist because we are talking about you know we were talking about uh, increasing enrollments and when how about retention. This is my yeah. main concern. I have to retain my students. So yeah. this is the main concern. Yeah. So I have to give high quality feedback right, right now. Mm -hmm. So it's interesting too because when she's talking about retention and all that, like usually at the end of the online courses they have students fill out the evaluation. We usually don't get the same scores, I suppose, that the in class ones or sometimes they don't even fill out. So the university even said, like, would you consider giving extra points if they feel like to them? No, no extra points. So I think there's a co complete different strategy, like the mindset is different. Mm -hmm. Yeah. In uh, at the ELC, we we have a already fairly low cap in classes. It's 18, uh, but for online, um, I I'm not sure whether we'll have uh, the first the first summer we'll have we'll have we had smaller sections. It was was basically a pilot. The biggest class was 11, uh, but we felt that that was about as much as we could handle. So I am a, I'm, I'm still thinking through it in my mind, but I'm a proponent of lowering enrollment caps for online classes rather than, mm -hmm. than, yeah. than MRG. Your online lines are pretty large. How many students? Now 25. It's a for a large class online, yeah, a lot, lot of responses. Yeah. Mm -hmm. the, the higher the enrollment, the potentially the higher, the lower the retention rate is going to be because the retention is improved well, by that. Well, it has been growing. Connection. I'm happy. Yeah. It's growing. Mm -hmm. So it's a lot of work, yeah. but... Any other questions? Yes. Mm -hmm. you know, from the regular, you know, instructional, even cyberspace. 
So that's not kind of what here, but yeah. I understand also the implications that they would like to have just wrap up the numbers yeah. and file all the people back. Yeah. We have this, there in some quarter, we don't know what's going to yeah. happen and have the general set up on minority forces. Right. And last year, when we asked you what is your hunt, what is happening in non-language context, because even the other, you know, like the science and stem, we do all that. Yeah. We are also coming, you know, like chemistry, biology, mathematics. We have one online course on campus mathematics, I think it's almost 500 plus students. <laughs> yeah. yeah, basic math. So I think so, and we have to you know, learn and keep that also in, in our site that we have to make sure that we are not. Uh, yeah, I mean, our courses are very different in nature, right? right. So if you go to an online, to a, to a regular intro to math lecture hall, right. maybe they have to be understood. Right. Right. So what, what kind of personal feedback do they get there? I don't know, not much, right? And it's, it's the nature of the class. They have to master certain skills and be able to solve certain problems and certain amount of time. So I guess that there's a place for that too, you know, if, if it works online. I, I'm not an expert on that. Uh, but I don't really fear that moving towards us. I don't, I don't really foresee a uh, you know, like, oh, now we're creating our fir the first ever online Hindi online course. So every single university in the country will now send their students in this one course. We have 500 students or 1,000 students. No, it's not gonna. It's not gonna happen. You know, like it's, it's language, language impossible. Language. Yeah, right. Because the software is not going to be able to keep that kind of thing back. When you say online, is it asynchronous or asynchronous? Asynchronous. We have like a, a very famous instructor, there, professor, graduate, and she teaches chemistry. Mm -hmm. And she has one of those classes. Right, it's like, yeah. Pack, have you met yeah, graduate? Yeah. And she's always talking about how exciting it is to teach online, how she gets the her <laughs> outstanding yeah. online every time. Yeah. It's very interesting, and how it works is like they have the classes. But then, like, she records videos every morning, the students like it. She's saying, oh, the breakfast is good. And she makes comment about what's going on in the day. And they kind of can relate to whatever, like, they're part of her life. Yeah. So I think that there are little things to learn. From. Technology is opening up all sorts of uh, different types of courses, right? Uh, I saw, I, I've seen s certain universities, for example, at UT Austin, they're doing this thing for their psychology program where they turned their intro psychology into a, a talk show, or like a, like a mm -hmm. yeah, it was like a TV show, basically. So there's uh, over a thousand students enrolled, but there's like a team of five professors and like 10 TAs and a video crew and graders. Mm -hmm. And so you, you kind of divide uh, the, the resource in a different way, uh, but it's still super expensive, right? I don't think it's less, I don't think it's cheaper for them to have course the way, but they've, they found that doing it that way for them, for that specific discipline, is improving the learning outcomes. So, so okay. that I, well, I try to withhold that information from information. Yes, in some, they say a truly professionally developed course in mm -hmm. content area, especially sciences, the cost is about half a million dollars. Right. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But that's okay. that's psychology. Yeah, you know, it's, it's a different yeah. culture. It's yeah, a different it's type different. of pedagogy. Yeah. What we are doing, uh, we, we don't have that much money. And we really, we really <laughs> value that interaction. Uh, you need it. Language you need interaction. To learn language mm -hmm. without interaction. Yeah. Yeah. And I don't think I mean, sure going to take it away from you um, as, long, as long as they are they're educated uh, on what language, online language pedagogy is. But yeah, it's, I mean, if you think about it with an administrative point of view, you're like, oh, you, you, they probably have their own bosses breathing on their neck, you're gonna save money, right? So they try to find solutions where they can. But if you respond in a educated way, they probably will listen to that. Yeah. Any other questions? All right, go ahead and take a look, take a shot of these questions uh, in your group. We probably already talked a lot about it, but... <laughs> I don't, uh, I don't feel like going through the question by question, but I'm more curious to see um, what just strong theme or question or what have you learned in this discussion? But, what, what so now you have your email, you need to email me. So yeah, absolutely, I'll do that. It was very nice to meet both of you. Great, thanks for Bye, bye.
I think I thought online, not online, but for share, which I use a lot of things like bit like what Emily was saying, like having a student, like an answering videos and blah, blah, blah. And I've taken two online courses as as a student, uh -huh. in part because I was interested in the language, in part because I thought that if I was going to teach online, I had to experience that. Mm -hmm. I know what Very I cool. feel in a face-to-face -face class because I learn English and other languages, but not. I've never. I think it's important to know what your students feel, so I thought it was important to take a class and feel what a student uh, feels in a, an online teaching class. And I think either if the design is well done, it can be very effective. I'm not sure with the as effective as face to face. I'm not convinced yet. And again, I, I'm I'm an advocate of, of online teaching. Like I, I'm the person I think in the Ishika who does more course share with me. So I mean, I, I'm already convinced, but I'm not convinced that, that I mean that I think it has to be super well designed in the same way that a bad teacher can sorry screw like a class. The same thing can happen with the bad design of online yes. mm -hmm. teaching. So it does have potential, but yeah, who knows? I mean, we, we still have to explore and more and more to see what happens. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm, I'm yeah I, I don't want to monopolize that. I agree with that, yeah, for sure. Um, in terms of potential, would you say, can be as effective? So is that what I'm hearing from you? If designed well, if led well? I think I'm a, I'm a, I became a, uh, but that's my point of view, very personal. I became foreign language teacher because I love what happens to class, I love interaction, I love group dynamics. And one of my biggest struggles with course share to share is to create the same group dynamics, good group, in, in an online setting. And I think that's a big challenge. I think we've gone very far. I think I've achieved a lot of things if I think where I was three years ago, where I am now, but still, it's not exactly, that magic, you, you've experienced that, that magic that happens in class. That feeling <coughs> of being part of a community, uh, and I think with a foreign language that's very important Be because because we are communicating because what we want uh, we need to communicate, and it's true that more and more students communicate by text and Facebook, blah blah blah, and we and they communicate online. But w fortunately, I think most of our communication still happens face to face, and I think. That, that's, that's why I think it is important to have that also in a language class. You can have also activities where they communicate and you cre can create community and group dynamics outside the class in an online platform. But I think the lack of this synchronous face-to-face -face communication, for me it's a still a challenge, but that's fine. Mm -hmm. uh, just for a comment, I, I agree and disagree at the same time. I, I think. Uh, it's interesting to think that online class and face-to-face -face class do not need to replace each other. Mm -hmm. You know, they can they can e exist. Online class has a completely different purpose. You know, it's to change a, a communities that cannot be face-to-face. -face. Not because you can put them in a classroom, we would put them in a classroom, but sometimes that's not the reality. That sometimes that doesn't happen. So you create a new strategy where you can effectively, because I think it can be very effective, mm -hmm. and still, provide the, the the teaching of the language to communities that are not sharing the same space. So they don't really necessarily are competing to each other, but they are still, in my opinion, they have different purposes. Mm -hmm. They have different, it's for other kinds of No, and, and I would always agree that it is better that than, I mean, very often mm -hmm. the option is either nothing or this, and in that case it's 300% better at. No, and it can be very interesting. I, I haven't really taught a completely online course because I am like you, I want to see my students, you know, so I had this online course with a meeting during the week where we would all get together with Zoom and at least say, oh, let's well, say if you have any questions, how was your week, how was your exercise, so we would do everything online but me. And then I taught a long distance class for Australian students where I, I was in Indiana and there was a classroom in Australia for one year, which actually was able, because of that, they established a Portuguese program in Australia. And when I traveled to Australia at the end of the year, I got there, the students were taking me out to 
sickle things, and they had a cake for me, and, and all they had was my face on my screen mm -hmm. for yes. one year. Exactly. You know, and it, it, and you think, why did it create a, a relationship? A relationship, you know, and it, so it's it's different. It's always different, but it, it's valuable. It's it, it's. You know, I think when it comes to Australia, there's a big time difference. There's a big so, time yeah, difference. Yeah, how did you manage to? You just get there in the next day. <laughs> 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 and just that so you missed the Sunday. Mostly in my case, I got there and I'm like, all oh, right, I'm teaching tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> you know, yeah, I thought I had a day. Oh, the, so the teaching. Well, I was teaching about it 8 30 at night. Which was morning for them the next. So it's a synchronous. Yeah, it's a, it was a synchronous. Yes, yeah, it was. So nothing it was is synchronous. So. Yeah. Oh my God. Yeah, no, 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 I mean, I understand the magic, the joy, the thrill of face-to-face -face interaction. I also enjoy that. You can still enjoy. But surprisingly, our students are actually their mode of communication had changed. It changed. Yes. <laughs> like for example, I'll give you my. I mean, I typically have all my students' uh, cell phone number in case I need to communicate something very fast or they have an appointment, I want to move it. I have just tried this random experiment. I have tried to call my students at a different time. Nobody ever picks up the phone. Yeah. If I text them, I get the response right. Exactly. Yeah, that's so that's the communication on the underground is not the same. They are not talking to each other as much as they used to. Mm -hmm. and even in a country like India, there are actual studies four people sitting in four rooms in the same house and on social media, Facebook, they are communicating quote unquote. <laughs> so this joy of face-to-face -face interaction, I think, uh, is a little getting overrated. You know, people are communicating less and less face-to-face. -face. This is a fact of modern life. Put a man in the room. 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 about what she's doing and I'm thinking yeah, yeah. this is not a joke the world is so totally changing right. is there a problem with me <laughs> <laughs> no, it's the question no. not being ready to change and join the and you know what to I, be continued what I noticed, I've noticed because I used to teach a face-to-face -face class and what I noticed is that the students are taking other classes online right. so the students are different now they are not the same anymore in classroom. No, yes, I think like if I get all that class advanced in it, one time one student had to take a lab course, the student was taking my advanced from by chatting, uh -huh. from sitting in the lab. Yeah. <laughs> so that's the point. So maximizing our changing, and then you teach the face to face, but you're yeah. going to see students using their iPhones, iPads, or everything, a computer in your classroom. And I'm already irritated. <laughs> <laughs> I don't get it. They tell me that I'm writing notes. You're right, but they are. Sometimes. And doing three other things. Okay. At the same they time. Know they know Like Facebook, yeah, yeah. and they go yes. close, and they're like going back to whatever. So you know, like you say something, and they go on the internet and fall into a hole, like because they want to know more about that thing that I told about Brazil, and then they go there and I'm like, hey guys. Yeah. You, mentioned you can do that. Like you can go online and straight. Okay, I, I get it. So, but I don't remember the date of the birth of this person. Okay, I'm gonna get it. And they, oh, that, that's the day. They already get it. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I teach yeah. another class I, face to face, but I see my students. They they have their uh, iPhones all the time there. It doesn't bother me because I know what they are doing. They need that. I, I, I would like to ask something to people that have been this experience online. Uh, one of the one of the uh, challenges, one of the challenges that I have in face to face classes uh, when it com is when it comes up, uh, to writing. So I like. 
So, so like uh, I'm talking about like uh, one of the challenges that um, I imagine because I never taught a completely online class is about um, you know um, student uh, cheating, like doing things that they should. So I I've been thinking about this a lot because of writing. Um, and um, for my first semester students, when I have them doing the uh, writing assignments, um, I used to have them do it all at home because they have time mm -hmm. to gather their thoughts and to research, which they are able to do. But I have been having a lot of troubles with people uh, doing Google, uh, Google uh, Translate, Translate and using the yeah. Even though it's yeah. clearly stated in all my assignments descriptions, you know, you shouldn't use that. So I, I kind of like the way that I um, changed it was that I, I had them do like one or two assignments at home and then I started having them write in class, which is not ideal. I wanted them to be able to go and explore the language and play with it a little bit more. But I was wondering like how you prevent cheating, mm -hmm. like, um, you know, make sure that they are actually doing the job, the learning, building so up. Can I add so or they are the ones who are actually classes. taking the text, test. Not their cousin, or like somebody, you know, right. somebody else. Yes. Goes, right. No, like, like them, for example. Yeah. 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 A Northwestern. So, like, no, no. these students. So, how are you going to require in a fully online course? You have to, they have to, you have to prove that at least twenty-five percent of the time is for the actual student to be here. You should be able to digitally check their presence. <laughs> An so, idea. An so, so make sure that the students, I mean, we're there in the class. That's what I say. <coughs> so, kids outsource. You do your writing assignment <laughs> yeah, at the lab. Yeah. They have the computer there because, you know, think about it. When we are writing uh, about anything, we want to check our sources, we want to check our grammar, we want to know if the, the word is you know, the right word. You need dictionaries, and you, you want to do your best. You you need a, a dictionary. Oh, but they, I, so the they, yeah, I know, but yes. But so so the thing is, what instead of uh, doing at, at at home because uh, we don't we don't know if they are doing by themselves or what's going on, uh, they do at the lab. So uh, I have done this this past quarter. They had to uh, write a composition. I gave them some pictures, and they had to build a story based on that pictures. And I gave them. Some things I'd like to see, we have been practicing some vocabulary on travels, and they had to use some of that, some subjunctive too, and stuff like this. So I said, now you have, they didn't know what they were going to write about. They knew what they had to use. So then there, was, there were three pictures, and they had to tell a story with those mm -hmm. pictures. They said, go and, and write the story following this. And I said, you, here is that you have 50 minutes, and uh, you can use the, 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 the computer. But I was there. I was uh, walking and having a look. But some of them were, they're not doing Google Translate. No. But they were consulting uh, dictionaries. They were consulting some uh, uh, websites for, for information that you would like to put in there. Uh, which story. And then, then I thought, you know, that's good because they have the computer and, they, they, and I'm here for anything. So maybe still using the technology, but being there. But now, now for online, totally online, you know, we are not there with them. I don't know, maybe we could have this, or there's a, an app that you can, you can see their screen. So you are at home and you can see each one's screen mm -hmm. while you are, and then you see if they are doing the Google Translate. It's possible. No, but then you, uh, Google you know, I don't so feel like you can just get away with the exams. There is no exam. They have all the types so of things they're graded on, but not a formal exam. Like yeah. Well, exactly. but what about writing? Well, there's then so you don't have that you need to, 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 to be able to yeah, teach them how to use the 21st century tools. Mm -hmm. um, so, <coughs> did an article for the, the teaching of German thing with one of my friends where we analyzed students using um, online translate and what kind of errors they could correct. Right and recognize, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and they, they can't. They're mm -hmm. so like it, they don't. They are going to recognize things they haven't been taught, mm -hmm. and so you have to decide whether or not it's academic dishonesty for them to use that, mm -hmm. or whether you need to train them on how to use the tools that they're going to be using once they leave your classroom. Anyway. Exactly. Which I think they're better. So 
like Daniel was saying yesterday, like they had tests in class and they had tests or tests online where they said you just don't use your book and try and do this. And who knows? They might have used their book anyway. But if there was no statistical difference yeah. in in that, like what is the point of us forbidding them from using tools that they're likely going to use anyway? Well, the other thing too, the writing, we use process writing, so they can review any time what they write. I, I really make that clear. You can get it back about there are 10 times, as many times as you need, so just do it yourself because you're going to get it back no matter what anyway. Yeah. 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 And I think uh, I agree with every completely. Like your Google Translate, uh, in journalists in India, I know that when something, you know, fast breaking news, you know, starts separating in English, all of them, the first you know, translate, Google translate, it is 60% correct only in Hindi. Yeah. But the good part of the task is that they have to just fix only the 40%. Mm -hmm. Thank so you. the whole world is using it anyway. So I'd rather teach them how to correct rather than not to say, don't use this. Or, or what are the errors <laughs> or that they see? Or to improve this, right, yeah. What is, I mean, that's like, that's a big, I mean, it's definitely a big right. debate going on. But mm -hmm. I mean, in an online environment like that, you can't police them and make sure that they're doing everything themselves, mm -hmm. right? They have to be, taking the course for them, you know? They're not gonna have their cousin be able to take the test every single time. Yeah. So the one time when they don't, they're gonna fail. Mm -hmm. You know, if, yeah. if that's how they're progressing. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so you, for each, each course is different, right? So you just, you want to create a plan for the course that, give, considering everything, gives you a fair amount of assurance that its students can be accountable, right? So different checkpoints where, okay, is the student's performance kind of the same, or less slightly improving it should be, or is like, this one is amazing, this one is terrible, and why is that, right? So you have conversations with students, <coughs> training how to use the tools. For ask, asking yourself, am I asking the students too much? If, if at week five you ask them to write a paragraph, yeah, they're gonna go and translate, because they can't to write a paragraph in the entire language of week five. Um, so like, all those things is, uh, but for each course, you're gonna make a case, right? Um, and process writing is a big one because it's their work, it, you see it all the time, and it's, it's always the same thing, uh, progressing, um, personalized assignments. Um. Mm -hmm. And I, th yes. I think very often, at least with less monitored languages, we have, I would say, I would assume, highly motivated mm -hmm. students yes. because yeah. usually they choose it not as a requirement, but because they want it. If not, they go for us. Yeah. Daniel was saying yeah. yesterday Spanish and then, uh, yeah. mm -hmm. uh, which I think another concern is what happens when I, I'm thinking of our colleagues in Spanish that have like, uh, and, and people taking their courses as a requirement, then sometimes, yes, you have more problems with, with cheating or people or native speakers that just, you know, go through mm -hmm. the compositions and things like that. So yeah, it, it depends on the course. And I think in that, in that sense, in terms of cheating, I think we're kind of lucky. I, I like to think that most of my students, be, because they are highly motivated and because they... Yeah. And even if they do use Google Translate, it's inside a strategy of learning to deal with real yeah. tasks and challenges in the second language, which includes translating, because I still use it sometimes. Mm -hmm. I'm yeah. an expert yeah. yeah. right? So, uh, yeah. so you still do it, it does your students will do it. Students yeah. cannot use it. I, mean, I remember this final yeah. first week we had oral presentation and lunch student was like, and on New Year's people do and then toast in English is the same word for two things, different things. Yeah. Right? So have like a toast that you eat. Yeah. The, the cheers and the toast on the, the toast. So she used the toast to eat and the toast to yeah. eat. Yeah. And it was like, and people to have, you know, do to have. I'm like, it was something. <laughs> Yeah, something similar to that came up when the German department at which I was working, the word for um, students would try to translate the word traffic jam into German, which is der Stau in German, but they would come up with Fikel's Marmelade, which is <laughs> commuting marmalade. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so sometimes it can even be fun, you know? Yeah. 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 I hate to be the one who argues the other side, but I am going to because I realize that even in the regular classroom, my students don't think that the people who get paid to write papers for their yeah. friends. So here we are. What, here I am very worried about cheaters. But the cheaters are everywhere. And people are, pay, people are making money off of 
Yes. Yeah, yeah I've, seen, I've seen it in the tiny inside of the universe. Yeah. So she's like, we are here. So, yeah. well, um, I, I think I would love something in the future where you uh, show us how to do these uh, courses without exams. This is oh, something yeah. I've heard a few people talk this about, and design. I'm thinking this is fascinating. How liberating to teach students to learn versus just waiting for them to cram, which they are going to do for that exam and not show me a process, but I'm not sure I know how to do that. That's good deal. Yeah, I mean, I think that would be really interesting, but it, in my impression for, for the Spanish online course, it was just that they transferred their, what would have been an in-class test to an online format, right? And had it not be like, you know, the test, they just said, try to do this without your book. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. And so, synthesis homework. So, yeah. And so they still had multiple attempts. I mean, I had students where I gave them as many attempts as they wanted on homework and they would still fail because they just wouldn't do it. Yeah. So if you give them the multiple attempts and they can achieve the A if they're grade motivated, they're going to do it. Right? <laughs> and I, I think there's a difference between. <laughs> like wanting them to be able to come out um, like absolutely fluent, right, from our programs versus where do we want to get them intermediate. We want them to maybe in class to say, okay, we're practicing these things, these actual can-do statements because we want them to be able to converse here. Mm -hmm. Yes, we want to focus on grammar, but that's online, that's graded there, right? That's when you're doing your at-home stuff. Here, we're working on conversing. Like that's a way to do it where the classroom thing is getting them up to that intermediate high proficiency level, but they're still getting the grammar that they need. Yep. But it's flipped, so right? Is that what you're doing? Like what we have is that we have pre and post assignments. Before we even get to class and review a material, they've already done so much stuff, some work on their own at home to know what's coming, activate their schematic, that their brain is open to receive the new stuff. The problem is, it, it, everyone probably experienced that. Not everyone is that achiever that complete their homework when they're supposed to. You know, you can tell by their face, like, what is it that we're talking about? <laughs> 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 the one that's like, lost, where have you been? I mean, you know, it's like, hey, class, wake up. <laughs> we're always going to have like, those, those students in the mix. It's part of it. I think there's always this percentage that you can't control. But as but Daniel said, if you, if you cater to them and start saying, oh, well, let me review this for you, yeah, they're never going to listen. You won't have yeah, yeah, they're never going to do it. Do and it's right. not fair to the others that, because right. we also have the high achievers, people that are like on the second month, they've already completed the whole True. book to the end of the semester. It's like, all right, yeah, let's go to the next. <laughs> <That's>, <laughs> but I mean, we do have those too. But because they're so worried, I'm not talking for myself, yeah. let me admit, I'm so worried, okay, if, I'm, if I don't repeat it again, then they'll mess up their enrollments. I should just say, if you want to drop, drop. But this fix about the enrollments makes me enable bad behavior, mm -hmm. honestly. Yeah. So if you have more students from all over, then you'll be less worried about that, right? Say, uh, yeah. <laughs> you're teaching. Well, I'm very honest with my students that they are not able to continue an online course. I'm very you know, honest with them and say, mm -hmm. well, Look at your participation. If you think that you are continuing like this, not participating, and you are going to get good grades, it's not going to work. So they drop. Mm -hmm. It's okay. I don't want this kind of student in my mm -hmm. class. See, some, uh, my, some students actually say, I've had athletes who don't care. They just want to get a D. This is I mean, that's, that's the only thing you need wow. to pass. Yes, so, but the, uh, now that person is taking the space of the kid who already has A plus. Mm -hmm. That's anyway. That's another thing. Yeah. <laughs> I think it is a, it's, it's a challenge, the challenge to meet in the middle. Somehow, be able to cater to like both these students, try to motivate the ones to want a little more, yeah. to understand that they would need a little more to progress, and the other ones like let's be patient with that one while we can try to carry as a group. I think we're out of time. Thank you so much for so the conversation. Thank you, guys. Yeah. quick plug as well to TUBVP, which is the language learning podcast, <coughs> education podcast that we run here. Uh, so if you go to TUBVP.com, you can sign up 
for the email address, and we go live every Thursday at 3, and there's, you can listen to us on iTunes and uh, binge listen to all my uh, past episodes. We got two seasons out already. Um, I'm the guy writing the emails and doing the Twitter and everything, so uh, if you want to hear from me more, just sign up. Uh, this is awesome. Bill Van Patten, who's a, a professor here, is, a, is a, the host of the show, and we talk about issues uh, of second language acquisition, really relevant. This is for language teachers. It's not theory. It's very, very much practice oriented. <coughs> so I'm a listener, and I'm great, so yeah. Yeah. It's good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. In bed for yeah, what's yeah. happening. <laughs> And listen I don't to have car, any listen in the gym, listen when you're cleaning. <laughs> <laughs>